I have to say, if I'm being honest, for me, all food is comfort food. But there are times when, because of work or the pressures of life, you really need a bowl full of something warm and familiar or a slice of something sweet, just to make you feel the world is a safer place. Mad. I know I'm about to cook some mashed potatoes, but it's not because I think you need a precise recipe for them, but just because I couldn't even contemplate comfort food without starting here. Cream? Not too much, just the right amount. You can use milk, of course, but do not even consider semi-skimmed or skimmed. It has to be full fat. And then some butter. Now, I think it really makes a real difference if the milk or cream or whatever is warm. It seems to make the mash more tender. Now, this is my favourite bit, the potato ricer. And why this makes a difference, and it's cheap, and I just got it from the local supermarket, is that you don't have to peel the potatoes. You just stick them in as they are, which makes this entirely manageable, and just force it through. Just enough power needed to make this satisfying, but not too hard for a wimp like me. And then you can just peel back the skin that stays there, so it makes life so much easier. Now, white pepper. And I think this is the thing that makes the difference. Fresh nutmeg, which in large quantities is a hallucinogen, and in small quantities induces a wonderful feeling of well-being. Object of the exercise. Quick taste. Mm. And salt then. And I think a bit more butter, since what I'm doing here is seeking to offer protection from life solely through the means of potato, butter and cream. This is probably enough protection from life as it is. And I don't think, to be honest, you need to have mashed potato win it with anything. I'll leave those there for later, actually. A modest portion. Mm. There are times when only mashed potato will do. Mm. Now, the thing about cold mashed potato is that it doesn't taste so good reheated, but it makes really good fish cakes. This is tin salmon, and actually they taste more like nursery food, and it's that that's so comforting. Anyway, children love them too, which is good. Just an egg, some cayenne pepper, not too much, especially if children are going to be eating them, and zest of half a lemon. If you're using cold boiled potatoes, which you just put through the ricer, then add a bit of melted butter to give them that lovely richness. And just mix together. Any drawback of canned salmon is it does smell a bit like cat food but it just tastes so delicious that you just have to uh, suffer this bit. And form them into patties or about the size of, you know, your palm. It's not rocket science. You can make them whatever size you want. And just stick them on a baking sheet. I just line it with cling film so they don't stick. And they need to sit in the fridge for a while because if you were to try and fry them straight as they are, they would just kind of gloop all over the place. And all you do is dip them in some beaten egg, and then in, I use mozza meal after that, you could use breadcrumbs, and then fry them in butter and a teeny bit of oil. Okay, doke, that's it. So, to the fridge.
I just couldn't sleep securely in my house at night unless I have a store cupboard banked with food. I have to say, food is to me what shoes were for Imelda Marcos. This is my chocolate stash. Now, of course, I keep these for cooking, you understand, but they are very, very necessary, these buttons here, for middle of the night when only chocolate will do. And then a sugar, great for making you feel very reassuring and that your house is banked about with good things. Vanilla pods and caster sugar. And frankly, all you need to do is put a teaspoon in some warm milk at night. Life's better. And this is my absolute favorite rice for risotto. For me, the ultimate comfort food. And you know, it's not just that risotto is comfort food. I think it's comfort cooking. And I know that a lot of people make a fuss about making risotto and worry about, you know, when it's the right stage and is it too finickety. But I have to say, I find mindless repetitive activity, this is what this is, just stirring, immensely comforting. If you can't get shallots, don't worry, just use the white part of some spring onions. Chop these as finely as you've got patience for. I mean, you can use a processor, it just seems a bit mad to give yourself that washing up just for a bit of shallot and celery. Talking of which, I know that a lot of people don't like celery, but what I would say is this won't make the risotto taste of celery. It just gives it a sort of mellow herbalness and a lightness that makes such a difference. Perfect. Right, butter. A bit of oil. This is ordinary olive oil, not extra virgin. And that will stop the butter from burning. Now rice, this is lovely stuff, like some flat pearls. 300 grams. Now, there is a kind of direct ratio, obviously, between the amount of rice and stock. And for that 300 grams, I want a litre of stock, by which I mean water from a recently boiled kettle with some of these vegetable stock granules, which are incredibly good. Now, this wonderful celery and shallot mixture. That won't sizzle much because I don't want this to cook over high heat. I want it to stay pale and I want it not to harden, just cook into a kind of mellow flavour. And what you can do, if you don't want onions to burn, is just sprinkle some salt on top and the salt releases the liquid inside the onion and that stops it from colouring. It might sizzle a bit uh, just a minute after as the water goes into the butter, but that's fine. And now I just tumble in the rice and stir around. The idea here is that the rice gets covered in this vegetable butter. It gets slicked and glossy. And then when you start ladling in the stock, it will start to swell and absorb all the stock. And then it starts giving off that wonderfully starchy, creamy quality that turns this into risotto. Right. So just ladle the stock in and you have to wait until the rice has absorbed that ladleful before you carry on with the next ladle. Now after the rice has absorbed you know, about three or four ladlefuls, you can start sort of swashing a bit more in and it doesn't matter if you don't keep stirring all the time, you can just get on with anything nearby, you can't leave it. But... Now it should take about 20 minutes for all the stock to be absorbed and for the rice to be cooked. But it's hard to be absolutely precise because you know, even different bags of the same sort of rice you know, differ enormously. So I am going to get on with chopping a bit of rosemary. Not too much. The thing about rosemary is if you use a small amount, it gives a sort of wonderful pronounced herbal hit. If, however, you go just slightly overboard, you just get soapiness. So in with these lovely fresh green spikes. And mm, zest of, I don't know, about half of an unwaxed lemon. Now, off the heat, gonna add the final bit of egg and lemon and cream, the manticatura. So, one egg yolk. Doesn't matter if there's a bit of white to it, you just don't want too much. Cream. And this. It's wonderful, really kind of balances the sharpness of the lemon later. 
Parmesan. Just wonderful pale curls of it. And lemon juice. I like this sort of ritual disemboweling of the lemon. Oh, and then whisking it turns it into this wonderful primrose emulsion. And then stir in this and it turns this rather sort of pale rice into this extraordinary kind of blonde risotto. Mm. And just stir it until it's so wonderfully soupy allonde, the Venetians call this. It means with a wave to it. Perfect. Now, in theory, this would be enough for supper for two. In practice, I rather feel one. So you eat this, you know the world is a better place. Right, this is supper, and what I love about this is that it's incredibly simple. It's just sweet potato, ordinary potato, peppers, garlic, onion, chopped up, not peeled, in a roasting tin, and then when everything's cooked, a bit of halloumi cheese just sliced on top. So you can be as tired as you probably are and still cope with this. Because ordinary potato takes longer to cook than sweet potato, the, the ordinary white potato should be a bit smaller. So do this about four centimetres square. And all these vegetables, I mean, the, both the potatoes, even the ordinary potato, but especially the sweet potato, the red onion and the peppers are all very sweet, which I suppose is also why it's comforting. But the halloumi is incredibly salty, and the contrast between those two is just perfect. Right, the onion just in quarters or eighths. Red and yellow peppers, garlic. Right, where's my oil? Here it is. And this is the bit I like in a minute. Just go like that with your fingers just so that everything is covered a bit. And then some pepper, don't put salt on. One, because the halloumi later was very salty, but also because what you don't want is water to leach out of the vegetables. You want them to roast rather than braise. And that's sort of three quarters of an hour in a fairly hot oven. So look, the vegetables are cooked and golden, so just slice the halloumi, stick it on top and put it back in the oven or under a grill until the cheese has begun to melt. So the halloumi is blistered and brown and a bit of parsley just to add oomph and eat it straight out of the pan. When it comes to comfort food, this is it. The real McCoy, or rather, the real McOy. It's a chicken soup, Jewish penicillin, soother of life, restorative broth, feet, very important part. This is a boiling chicken. It looks scraggy, but there is so much more flavor in it. All I've done with this is boil it, some salted water, for about two and a half hours, with carrots, onion, not even peeled, bay leaves, celery, parsley stalks, and some peppercorns. What I like is to have this very clear soup and in it some dumplings, not any old dumplings, knedelach. And these are just dumplings made with mozza meal, which is a sort of cracker crumbs, egg, and although in this context, believe me, stodge is good, uh, in order to make the dumplings really sort of as fluffy as they can be, you need to whisk this egg very, very well. And next comes a crucial ingredient, schmaltz. Now, schmaltz is just chicken fat. Otherwise, you can use goose fat. Uh, 
really, if you're not going to go on either of those ones, it should be margarine. I prefer butter, which is absolutely in um, conflict with every Jewish dietary law, so it's up to you. But a couple of tablespoonfuls of the soup stock or water, I mean, whatever. Salt and pepper. And then 100 grams of mozza meal. Do you just whisk in? Now, you want this mixture to be firm enough to make little dumplings out of, but just with a bit of stickiness so that they're going to be lighter. They need to be in the fridge for half an hour to an hour to firm up. And this is about the right texture here. So just stick these in the fridge, and in half an hour, we can make our knedla. Now, the chicken soup in all its pure goldenness. Now, I'm sieving it through some kitchen towel just to remove any excess fat. What you can do, and I tend to do normally, is just cook it the day before and then put it in the fridge and you just kind of skim off the fat because it solidifies on top. There were some scientific tests of chicken soup recently which showed that it actually did possess anti-inflammatory and antibacterial properties, although I do have to say that the true believers, and I mean that in the culinary rather than devotional sense, need no outside corroboration. You just have to taste this, even just look at it to know that it's going to do you good. Now for my little dumplings, or not so little, the canadlers do swell as they cook. And they've had about 20 minutes simmering in salted water. They float to the surface when they're cooked in any way. They start looking kind of fluffier and just ready to be eaten. Mm. Look at these little babies going in. If you wanted not to bother with a knedel bit, just put in some cooked noodles or rice. Ah, oh, this is it. Now look, look at this golden ladleful. You need comfort food, you want chocolate cake, and this chocolate cake is kind of doubly comforting because it's incredibly easy. So I've just put in here 175 grams of unsalted butter, which I melted and then it cooled a bit. And I know I don't normally, you know, give precise measurements, but that's because baking, you do need to be precise, not just spontaneous. You have to obey the rules. 125 mils of corn or other vegetable oil, and 300 mils of ice water. Just mix these together. And now it's just a question of kind of plonking a couple of bowlfuls of things in. In this bowl, I've got 400 grams of plain flour, 250 of golden caster sugar, but I mean, use ordinary caster sugar if that's easier, 100 grams of light muscovado sugar, 50 grams of the most wonderful brown and sort of earthy cocoa, two teaspoons of baking powder and a teaspoonful of bicarb. And it's just whoosh in here. And then just mix this. Now, it makes a very liquid batter, this cake, and that's what keeps it so wonderfully moist later, so don't be alarmed that it's not, you know, a thick, spoonable cake mix. It's just cocoa batter. Look at that. OK, so the third and final stage. In here, in one of those small tubs of sour cream, three eggs and a tablespoonful of really nice vanilla extract. Have a stir. And then, let's see how easy this is, just add that. Stir again. We're not talking strenuous exercise, but we are talking deep, deep pleasure. So perfect. Okay, now these are just a couple of ordinary sandwich tins, nothing special. Uh, some baking parchment on the base and a bit of butter on the side. And all you need to do with this is 
pour it in just half in each tin and I'm not going to scrape it all out because licking out the bowl is an elementary part of the comfort and pleasure. That's it really, dust now in the oven. To ice a chocolate cake, you need a really good chocolate icing, and this, of course, is the fundamental part. It's melted. Now, I melt chocolate in the microwave because it's kind of easy, about three minutes of medium, and I use these chocolate buttons. One, because they're very good, but also because I don't have to chop the chocolate before I stick it in. And what makes this icing very fudgy is a modest amount of butter. Pack it. Has to be soft, has to be unsalted. And... 275 grams of icing sugar has to be sieved so the icing is smooth. Just add it gradually, spoonful by spoonful. So these cakes on the cooling rack had about, I'd say, just under an hour in a 180 degree oven. And what you'll notice is the centers are still slightly soft, but the cakes will be springing away from the tins on the outside. And you need to let them cool thoroughly because otherwise the icing will just melt. I'd have to live dangerously and make this bit faster. Last bit. It's going to have a bit of a scrape down. It's worth being patient here simply because you want the icing to be really smooth. All I need now is some good vanilla extract. No synthetic essence, please. And this chocolate, which has cooled slightly, so it won't make the butter greasy. Look at this. Mm. River of chocolate. Just mix this and it should be combined and really divine. Perfect. You've been chapped. This is the cake you want to eat. All of it. Mm -hmm.